Okay, you guys. Hi, and welcome to our annual legacy event. My name is Betsy Ogren. I'm the program director at Inheritance of Hope, and I'm joined by our leadership team tonight because we wanted to be among the very first to welcome you. We are just thrilled that all of you have chosen to spend the weekend with us. As you saw in the video that just played, there were lots of little did you know snippets. So one of those was that our very first retreat had six families back in 2008. So it's fun to just look back on that and now see so many names on our attendees list. We have over 500 families together this weekend and we are gonna have a great time together. What we would love to see in the chat right now is where you're from and if you have a favorite Inheritance of Hope memory. That was one of the questions that was also in that video. So if you had a minute to think about that, please share it in the chat. We would love to get a glimpse of who's here and also to see how you connected with us at Inheritance of Hope. We have families connecting with us through Hope at Home groups, on our weeknight um, gatherings, through Hope at Home weekends, and from Legacy Retreats, lots of different ways that people are connecting. One more fun did you know that wasn't in the video is that in the past 12 months, we have provided four times more family services to young families facing the loss of a parent than in any prior year. So we are celebrating that. And also we are gonna be looking forward to ways we can stay connected as we go through this weekend. Tonight is all about legacy. And our very first speaker is going to share with us some of her personal family story. It is, I think, going to be a really special um, speaker. I want to tell you a little bit about Shay Bynes. She is originally from Florida. She's married to her high school sweetheart. She is the mom of three daughters. She is also a storyteller, a speaker, an author, a teacher. She helped to found a Kingdom Driven Entrepreneur. She is a busy lady, but tonight she is with us. And so I am looking forward to hearing about her legacy as we kick off this annual legacy event. Please join me in welcoming Shay Vines. My father, Robert Thrasher, is 81 years old. And when he was in high school, he had an opportunity to have a conversation with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You see, Dr. King was speaking at a church in Athens, Georgia, which was walking distance from where my dad lived. And he had heard so much about Dr. King and he was curious to hear more. So he went to the church to listen to his speech. And after his speech, he went up to him to ask him to share more with him about what he was trying to accomplish. You see, my dad didn't really have a full picture of the inequalities and the injustices that surrounded him. Even living in the Deep South, he just didn't have a full awareness of what was going on. He grew up in segregated all Black schools. He had experienced uh, places and spaces that he could not have access to because of his skin color. But at the same time, he grew up having great relationships with a number of white children. He used to go to work with his mother, who worked at a sorority house, and through going to work with his mom, he would have access to other children, and he just played nicely with white children. And even then, as a high schooler, he was working alongside an older white gentleman who was essentially mentoring him in the area of construction. They were working side by side on an apartment building project. So my dad was living the dichotomy of segregated life and integrated life. And so he really didn't have a full appreciation of what was going on. But that conversation that he had with Dr. King really opened his eyes uh, to the, rea the realities of injustices. And one of the things that Dr. King said to him is that there are many ways that you can be effective in your community. Some of those ways are outward, like protests and demonstrations. And some of those ways 
are working quietly behind the scenes. My dad chose the path of working quietly behind the scenes. It started when he moved to Los Angeles, California, and he started working at the Urban League. And his main job was to work with local companies on job training and job creation uh, to create opportunities within the Black community. And then this continued when he moved to Florida. He moved to Florida with my mom, my oldest sister. Uh, some years later, my middle sister and I uh, were also born there in Florida. And even though in Florida, he was not doing, um, you know, the community empowerment type of work that he was doing at the Urban League, he made a series of intentional decisions, which he says were led by God, to put our Black family in very white spaces. And I mean, pretty much everywhere. We would be one of a few or the only Black faces, but it was my dad's intentional decision. Now, what was interesting is that whether it be in the workplace or whether it be in the local church, my dad was consistently elevated into leadership positions that allowed him an opportunity to tear down walls and to build bridges. Now, do you want to know how old I was when I found out that my dad had a conversation with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I was 40 years old. And the rest of what I shared with you, uh, as well as plenty that I didn't have an opportunity to share with you, I just found out last year in 2020, when I asked my dad if I could sit with him and record an interview with him about his life. We just did it via Zoom. I'm in Florida, my dad's in Georgia, we recorded an interview. And I found so much hidden treasure in the open spaces of that conversation that I had with my dad. My mom, Vermel Thrasher, uh, she passed away earlier this year uh, peacefully. Uh, she was 81 years old also when she passed. And last year after I had the interview with my dad, I asked my mom if I could also interview her about her life. Now, <laughs> my mom was sassy, and so it took a little bit of convincing to get her to say okay to recording a conversation with her, but eventually I got her okay and we did it. And because of kind of what was going on with her health-wise, she had um, some difficulty remembering everything, but what was super clear was about her intentionality around several things. For example, she was intentional about going to college to get primarily her MRS degree. <laughs> and I mean to find her a husband, which she did, my dad, but she also got a degree. She was intentional about being a stay-at-home mom with me and my sisters. She was intentional about expressing her desire to work and to serve by doing it, uh, not with a full-time career, but by doing it through volunteerism, working uh, within the local church, uh, serving in PTAs, uh, serving in Girl Scouts, you know, just leading in various community-focused efforts. And she was also super intentional about how she desired to express her creativity, which she did through sewing. She was a brilliant, brilliant seamstress. And she never wanted to make a business out of it. <laughs> it was her hobby that she loved to express her creativity, but she also didn't want to bug my dad about money all the time. So what she'd do is she would offer her services and sew for other people and make money from time to time. And then she'd have her extra money. But all of this was very intentional and it was so rich hearing my mother share about these decisions that she had made over the course of her life. And what was so clear to me was that my mom was the epitome of what it looks like to lead and to faithfully serve others well wherever she was planted. And that was so powerful to hear from my mom. It, I was, it was really so interesting how much I learned from both of them that I had never heard before. There were hidden treasures in the open spaces of the conversation and their story. Now, I wanna share with you three of the hidden treasures that were found 
and the open space of conversation and their story. One of them was inheritance. You know, that conversation, a series of conversations that I had with my dad really unlocked something powerful for me. I, it unlocked an aspect of my identity and my inheritance that he has pat, that he passed to me as a bridge builder. It's something that I hadn't really thought about until that very moment, that that is what my dad passed me. That was part of his inheritance. What was also very clear is that both my mom and my dad have passed on a legacy of family, of faith, and of intentional focus. Those are all aspects and gifts that they had passed on to me. And what was interesting is that it was so timely to have that bridge builder aspect of my identity unlocked because at that time last year, I was experiencing a lot of nudges <laughs> about shifting how, what I was doing in work. You know, I had been, you know, CEO of the company that I you know, co-founded for the last several years and God was it was beginning to compel me into other areas, areas that were not familiar to me, areas that I didn't have expertise in, but knowing that piece of identity and inheritance from my father as a bridge builder was so key to making sense about a, a very important aspect of what I had to bring to the table and what was to come. A second hidden treasure really related to that was affirmation. Having those conversations uh, really helped a lot of things make sense. I'm going to go back to that bridge builder thing. It really affirmed, it helped me make sense out of things from my past. It helped me make sense out of things in my present. And it helped affirm me for what I need to carry in the days ahead and just my life's purpose and the assignments and my own life. And looking at that aspect of being a bridge builder helps me make sense out of why I'm so like over the top intentional about creating relationships with people of a variety of backgrounds, why I am unapologetic about getting a diverse set of people involved in the things that I'm involved in and getting a diverse set of, ex of, of perspectives, not just cultural divides from a racial and an ethnic perspective, but generational, yeah, gender, you know, I want both, I want both men and women, you know, I want generations from their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, or 60s. I want different ethnic groups. I mean, it's it's something that is always burned on the inside of me and something that I always do do probably way more than the average person <laughs> but knowing that 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 unlocks something with me that I'm a bridge builder and that's what I'm carrying and that's what's important for me in the future it affirmed that for me and that legacy of family of faith and of intentional focus was just affirming that gift that they have passed on to me that I get to build upon the third gift the third hidden treasure found in the open spaces of conversation and story was gratitude. Wow, such an increased gratitude for the goodness that's within my father, for the goodness that's within my mother that I get to build upon, that they have imparted into me. And gratitude, if you didn't know, it's powerful. Gratitude. Scientific, science will show you that gratitude is powerful for being able to persevere. Gratitude is powerful for having a positive outlook on life and positive outcomes. Gratitude helps us uh, physiologically, mentally, emotionally, in so many ways. There is so much power and goodness and gratitude. And I found that as such a hidden treasure in, the, in these open conversations that I had with my mom and with my dad. Now, what's interesting about also having these conversations with them is that what it really created inside of me is this desire and also what I've been doing, it's an application of creating these open spaces of conversation as a, just as a lifestyle. In other words, allowing others to mine the treasures that are found, the hidden treasures here, allowing them to mine those by creating these open spaces, by sharing 
my story, by not having to wait several years for someone to interview me to share, but just having that lifestyle of openness and of sharing, of sharing of myself. And I don't mean that just with my children. I mean that with those who are in my sphere of influence. I can't even tell you how much value there's been of creating those open spaces for even those whom I mentor and how there is, there is an inheritance within me there's inheritance that we have naturally with our family members, but there's also spiritual inheritance that may be found in other, other people. So there's been so much goodness created in these open spaces with those whom I mentor that's affirming them, that's unlocking things for them, that they're able to mine those treasures now, and it is helping and propelling them into purpose. And you know, it's propelling them into their own assignments in their life. It's awesome when you think about this, that even though I shared stories about the conversation that I had with my mom and the conversation that I had with my dad, this whole idea about hidden treasures and open spaces of conversation, it relates to any of your family members. It relates to anyone whom you're close to. It relates to anyone who's just within your sphere of influence. There's hidden treasures there. And so my prayer for you is that you will really begin, that you're feeling compelled to begin or to go deeper into discovering the hidden treasures within the people around you, your loved ones, and that it's a gift that you then express to the people around you. Because the truth is that your ceiling is the floor for somebody else. I am so grateful for this opportunity to speak uh, with you here. I'm grateful for the work of Inheritance of Hope. And, you know, I'm just believing for just so much goodness, grace, power, and all of that for each of you as you mine those hidden treasures. So thank you so much for your time today and God bless you. Oh my goodness, Shay Vines, that was so, so good. I took away so many nuggets from your talk. You call them hidden treasures. Um, there were so many things that I really loved about what you shared. And I would love for every, we would love for everyone to start typing in the chat what you are taking away from Shay's talk. So make sure you chat to everyone. Don't just chat to panelists, chat to everyone because we all want to know what your favorite thing was that you learned from Shay tonight. Um, I'm gonna ask some of my colleagues what their favorite takeaway, their nugget tonight was, but I think that one of my favorite hidden treasures was when Shay was talking about how she interviewed her mom and dad. And I just love that she recorded that. And so I don't know about you guys, but to me, the first thing I thought of was legacy video. That is something at Inheritance of Hope that we value. Um, I love legacy videos. I wonder of my colleagues here, how many of you guys have made a legacy video? Ah, everybody's made a legacy video. I've made several in my life and I know that they are just such a priceless gift to yourself and to your loved ones. And Shay, I just love that you made a legacy video with your mom and your dad. And if any of you are interested in making a legacy video, if you haven't already, um, Spencer actually, right, is, is doing a breakout session on Sunday that everyone is welcome to join to learn more about legacy videos. And I hope that you guys will join him there on Sunday. Um, but I love reading in the chat everything that you guys loved about Shay's talk. Um, please keep chatting. I want to hear more. Um, what were your hidden treasures that you took away from Shay? And then maybe one of or two of my colleagues here want to share what their favorite nugget or takeaway was from Shay's talk. Who wants to talk? Heidi, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I saw Dylan raising his hand, but yeah, I'll go. And then Dylan, follow up if I don't hit it. Um, I loved when she was talking about how she found out about her, um, her dad and the relationship that he had with Dr. Martin Luther King. And I thought, oh my goodness, she didn't find that out until she was 40 years old. 
Um, but the intentionality of just having those conversations and what nuggets come out of those, um, that it's like never too late. That wasn't something that she discovered, you know, way back when, but she was able to find that out later in life. Like, that's so cool. It, it encourages me to kind of press into some of my older family members and just ask questions from back when and see what, what comes out. Yeah, totally. And she doesn't even look like she's 40 yet. So I, I don't really get to hear that part, but I Lucky agree. girl. Uh, Dylan, did you want to share something? Yeah, I can go. Um, one of the things that, that stuck out to me was one of her hidden treasures. And of course, uh, we are called Inheritance of Hope. And her first hidden treasure that she mentioned was inheritance and how her, her family kind of left this legacy of being bit, uh, bridge builders. Um, and I thought that was really cool. And that kind of came from uh, them building bridges between, you know, racial bridges, basically, where uh, their parents put them in situations where they were the minority intentionally. Um, and then they, you know, they use those uh, opportunities to glorify God and build relationships with people. And so I thought that was uh, something that, yeah, just stuck out to me a lot. Yeah, I love that too. And I think a lot of you in the chat also love that. Um, I see a lot of great feedback. Um, Shay, you have blessed us so much tonight with your words and your heart and just the legacy that your parents have left now and your legacy that's extended through this ripple. Um, so thank you for being with us on this annual legacy event. We um, really appreciate you. And I am very excited, um, just as Shay shared a story beautifully of her personal family um, legacy building, I know for sure this next special guest, I have seen him in concert before. He is a singer and songwriter and also an, an amazing storyteller. I think that's one of my favorite things about this next guest. He tells stories that just captivate you, but they're also all true. And so I am very excited. I'm sure my colleagues are excited. All of you are excited to hear from this next special guest. I'm so excited to introduce you to Matthew West. Hey everyone, it's such an honor to be able to share this time with you and to be the keynote speaker for this annual legacy event for Inheritance of Hope. I'm coming to you from my home studio in Nashville, Tennessee. This place is called, well, I call it the Story House, and this is where I write my songs, this is where I work on my podcast, and I write my books, and for now, this is where I get to send a message to you, and we're going to talk about the power of story. I'm passionate about the power of the story that lies within each and every one of us, more importantly, the story that God is writing with each one of our lives. The Bible says that God is the author and perfecter of our faith. I love that and I've learned firsthand that when, uh, when we realize that the pen is not supposed to be in our hands and we realize that uh, he is the true author of our stories, that's when our stories get good. That's when our stories become fulfilling. And speaking of stories, I have been so humbled and inspired as I have read the story of the origins of Inheritance of Hope. And so I just have to say, before we really dive in here, what an inspiration it's been to learn about uh, Kristen and Kristen Milligan's family and their desire to take um, their own trials in their life to turn it into a greater purpose and to see how God might use their story and their family to leave a greater legacy and to help other families who are going through a similar thing. It's just been so inspiring. I've read about these legacy retreats that are taking place and just the way that you're pouring into children and every part of the family component, um, providing hope and letting them know that they are not alone during challenging times ahead. So it's been really cool to read about that. And uh, I was thinking about the term, those legacy retreats. And I guess if I had a prayer for this time that we're gonna get to spend together, of course, this is what together looks like in today's world right now. But um, my prayer for these few minutes ahead would be that this might in its own way be a bit of a legacy retreat for you. I love to learn by hearing stories. Jesus always taught with stories. 
many of my songs, they are stories. That's really what I am, not just a songwriter, but a storyteller. It's just that my stories tend to rhyme and be put to chords and melodies. And I have to add that being asked to be a keynote speaker felt a bit foreign at first. I'm used to be maybe being known as a keynote singer. So no guitar feels a little weird, but don't worry, before I'm done with you, there will be music played. So, um, but I was just thinking about Legacy Retreat, and I guess my prayer for you in these next few moments is that you might be able to have just a little mini Legacy Retreat. I'm gonna share three stories that have taught me about legacy and have helped me think about the kind of legacy I wanna leave behind. And so we're gonna dive into three stories. What I learned about legacy from a guy named Ron, what I learned about legacy from a young man named Jordan, and what I learned about legacy from an Uber driver in Trenton, New Jersey. So let's dive in. Ron was from Houston, Texas, and Ron reached out to my ministry. My dad and I have a nonprofit ministry called Pop We. He's my pop, and we try to build a community of storytellers. And the heartbeat of the ministry is to help people learn how to craft, share, and live a more meaningful and fulfilling story with their lives, to recognize that God is at work in every chapters of our story, even the, even the broken chapters, right? And so Ron reached out to our ministry and he wanted to get me a message. And the message was this, Ron was in his final days battling with ALS. So for Ron, in the year of 2020, COVID was just another thing on a list of already um, immensely difficult battles that he was facing. But the message he wanted to share with me was this, every morning when his hospice nurses come in to care for him, he requests one song to begin his day. And he asks them to play a song of mine called Strong Enough. Now that song, the lyrics of the song were, were originally written for a single mom who shared her story with me about her uphill climb, trying to take care of her family since her husband walked out. And the words simply say, I know I'm not strong enough to be everything that I'm supposed to be. God, I give up. I'm not strong enough. Hands of mercy, won't you cover me? Lord, right now, I'm asking you to be strong enough, right? Uh, it comes from Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. And so I was really uh, humbled that Ron chose to start his day with his hospice nurses listening to the song, Strong Enough. And I thought, okay, well, in the, in the true spirit of of the times, I thought, well, maybe we could have a Zoom call together. This was in the summer of 2020. And I thought, I'm gonna have a Zoom call with Ron and get the chance to meet him. I got my guitar. I thought I'll play strong enough for him. For him. And I, I asked the Lord to give me some words to encourage this guy as he's in his final days battling with ALS. What I didn't realize is that Ron had other plans. You see, the entire Zoom call, I had a hard time even getting a word out because Ron's plans were to spend the entire time encouraging me. And I will never forget watching him fight to get his words out. And he would say things like, Matthew, God is so proud of you. Matthew, God loves you. Matthew, your best songs are ahead of you. Matthew, you have no idea how much God's using your music. On and on and on. Just kept encouraging me. And I sat there with tears in my eyes as I'm looking into my computer screen and I'm humbled to think, here's this guy fighting, um, fighting ALS. He knows he's in his final days and yet he's choosing to use some of his final moments and final words to encourage me. Little did Ron know that at that point in my life, I was at the deepest uh, point of discouragement that I'd ever faced in my life. I'm really scared about the future, scared about my career, scared about all these different things, and I was really discouraged. And there in that moment, the Lord was using a guy named Ron to see past his own battle and to encourage me in the middle of mine. And he had no idea what I was going through, but there it was, and I was so profoundly impacted by that. And I thought, where does, where does that type of perspective come from? Where does that peace come from? Because that's what I saw in his eyes, really, was peace. And I thought about it. I thought about Philippians 4.13, the very scripture that inspired the song that Ron likes to listen to. Now, sometimes we highlight a scripture and we forget the context. And I want to point to Philippians chapter 4, not just verse 13, but verse 12 as well. Now, of course, verse 13 says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ 
who gives me strength. I love that verse, don't you? I love the promise of God's strength when I feel like all of my strength is gone. But let's look at the verse in front of it. Verse 12, Paul says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. As I um, sat there encouraged by Ron, I thought, this is a guy who knows that this life on earth is not the final destination. It's the airport. And it was with that peace that he was able to see past his own battle and uh, give a legacy to me, to pass it down. Now, in one of the definitions of the word legacy is something, a thing handed down. And uh, I like to think that Ron handed that down to me, sharing um, past his own need to speak into mine. And so what I learned about legacy is that when you know who the author of your story is, you can find a contentment that Philippians 4.12 shows us. And contentment can be found in knowing that this life on earth is not our final destination. And God can give us the strength to leave a kind of legacy where people think about us, they say, you know what? He was able or she was able to see beyond their own need and be kind to somebody else, be encouragement to somebody else. And I'll never forget what Ron taught me about legacy. Now, when I get up on stage and I sing that song strong enough, I get to tell Ron's story. And his legacy is a thing that continues to get to be handed down night in and night out. Every night I get on stage, I share Ron's story and the crowd sings in honor of Ron. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You must, you must think I'm strong. To give me what I'm going through Well, forgive me, forgive me if I'm wrong But this looks like more than I can do On my own I know I'm not strong enough to be Everything that I'm supposed to be I give up I'm not strong enough, no Hands of mercy, won't you cover me, Lord, right now I'm asking you to be strong enough Be strong enough Cause I'm broken, down to nothing But I'm still holding on to the one thing You were God and you were strong when When I am weak, oh I all things through Christ who gives me strength and I don't have to be strong enough strong enough yes I know that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength and I don't I don't have to be strong enough strong enough oh I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength and I Strong enough, cause Lord, I know you're strong enough, and I don't have to be strong enough, cause you're strong enough. I learned a little something about legacy from a young man named Jordan. Now, Jordan heard me doing a radio interview in the city where he was driving to and fro with his wife in the car, and I was doing this interview on a Christian radio station. And I was talking about the power of our stories, and evidently, Jordan's wife nudged him and said, Jordan, you've got to tell your story. And so Jordan sent a letter to me, and I'm so glad he did. 
The first line, the first sentence that he wrote to me said, hello, my name is Jordan and I'm a drug addict. That was the very first sentence. He went on to tell me that he started out with a much more promising story. He was a good preacher's kid and we had that in common. I grew up a preacher's kid as well and so I was intrigued to hear more of Jordan's story. He went on to tell me that he grew up and became a gifted athlete, was a seven-time All-American in track and field in college. That's where our stories took harsh turns in different directions. I never became an All-American athlete. I'm a little bitter about that to be honest, but, um, but I was uh, really inspired by Jordan's story. He suffered a severe injury and ended his season, and he was devastated by it. And after the surgery, the doctors prescribed a pain medication called Oxycontin. And I was struck by Jordan's honesty and vulnerability when he shared with me in his story. He didn't focus on the highlights, he focused on the lowlights. He said, I hit rock bottom. He, he wound up becoming full-blown addicted to this Oxycontin and then progressed to other drugs, so much so that he began to steal from family. He failed two drug tests. He got kicked out of college, lost his scholarship. He went from being the big man on campus to not even being allowed to step foot on campus. But at his rock bottom was a praying mom and dad who said, Jordan, this is a busted up, broken chapter of your story, but it doesn't have to be the defining one. And so Jordan, as a last resort, decided to go kicking and screaming, he admitted, to a Christian drug and alcohol re uh, recovery program where he spent an entire year and what he shared with me is that while he was in this recovery program, he realized this was not just a battle with an addiction, this was a battle for his identity. And I was struck by that. He said, you know, I, I knew God, but throughout my life, I thought it was up to me to fill in the blank, to, to find out what was special about me, and then to validate my life and let people know why I was special. So you can imagine when he knew he was the big man on campus, he liked that name tag, right? Scholarship, All-American, those are some good things. But when that was wiped off of his name tag, he, he didn't know who he was anymore. And Jordan began to share with me how he rededicated his life to, to God and began to take steps forward in his faith. And he graduated from that recovery program and he began to share with me, he said, you know, the biggest thing that changed my life was the realization that on my best day, I'm a child of God and on my worst day, I'm still a child of God. After graduating from that recovery program, he went back to the college that kicked him out. He said they gave him a second chance. He got a degree. He stayed longer, got a master's degree. Today, Jordan's a high school teacher. Uh, he's a uh, uh, basketball coach. He's a husband and he's a father and he's, he brings his little boy to see their favorite singer every time I come to their city, of course. And the last sentence of the story that he shared with me said, you know, I used to introduce myself the way I did at the beginning of my letter, hello, my name is Jordan, what did he say? And I'm a drug addict. He said, but now I say, hello, my name is Jordan, and I'm a child of the one true king. And I'll never forget that, child of the one true king. First John chapter three, verse one, reminds us that that's actually all of our identities. It says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And then the next sentence in your Bible, if you look it up, it says, and that is what we are. And then you know what I love comes after that? An exclamation mark. Not a period, not a dot, dot, dot. That scripture wasn't written in past tense. It doesn't say uh, how great was the love the Father once lavished on us. We used to be called children of God until we screwed it up. Uh, there's nothing like that in the Bible. This Bible verse was written in present tense. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. So what did I learn from Jordan about legacy? Well, what I learned is that the discovery of who you are, I mean, are we not living in a world right now where everybody is infatuated with the search to discover your true identity? And we love to think that we hold the power within us, that the answers lie within us. I'm gonna tell you, you can search within yourself all day long. You can read a million self-help books and you will not find the help that you need because the journey to discover who you are be begins by first discovering whose you are, who you belong to. And when you tap into the reality that there is a creator, that there is an author of your story and that he's already given you the most significant title that you'd ever own, 
then you too can begin to take hold of the promise that Jordan allowed to change his life. On your best day, you're a child of God. And on your worst day, you're a child of God. May we all live our lives in such a way that the legacy, the thing that we hand down, when they look back at our lives, they say, you know what? He knew who he was. She knew who she was, not because of their accomplishments, not because of their highlight reels, but because they belonged to a savior and they knew they were deeply loved by God. Man, I wanna be that person who knows that my legacy is not defined by any of my personal achievements, but it's also not defined by my failures. And this is how good of a God we have. We start to feel so defeated when we make mistakes. That's how Jordan felt. He used to think, I'm going to be ashamed my whole life. I'm going to live a whole life of regret. I'm going to have those names on my name tag. But I love this thought. I felt like God showed me this thought that our, our, our failures do not define us. But God, in his loving mercy, can actually use our failures to refine us. And that's what he did with Jordan. That's what he's done with me. And that's what he can do with you. Hello, my name is Regret I'm pretty sure we have met Every single day of your life I'm that whisper inside That won't let you forget Hello, my name is Defeat I know you recognize me, yeah, yeah just when you think you can win I'll drag you right back down again Until you've lost all belief well, These are the voices These are the lies And I have believed them Oh yes I have For the very last time Hello, my name is child of the one true king. I've been saved, I've been changed, I've been set free. Amazing grace is the song I sing. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. Whoa, 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 yeah, yeah. I am no longer defined by all the wreckage behind, yeah, yeah. Cause just one who makes all things new has proven it's true. Take a look at my life, oh, 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 oh. hello, my name is Child of the One True King. I've been saved, I've been changed, I've been set free. An amazing grace is the song I sing. Hello, my name is Child of the One True King. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. What love the Father has lavished, yeah, upon us that we should be called His children. I am a child of the one true king. What love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called his children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. I've been saved, I've been changed, I've been set free. An amazing grace is the song I sing. Hello, my name is Child of the One True King. Here's what I learned about legacy from an Uber driver. Okay, so picture this image, all right? It's March 12th, I believe, 2020. I'm inside an arena in Trenton, New Jersey. We're getting ready for a concert, a big concert in an arena. We were excited, and yet, we were surrounded by uncertainty and all of the concern and fear around COVID-19 that was beginning to do more than just bubble underneath the surface. Everybody was getting scared and, and con confused and concerned and not knowing what to do. And lo and behold, that day in the arena, we had a meeting and we were informed that the governor was shutting the city down 
Not only was that concert going to be canceled, but the rest of our tour was going to be canceled. With that, out of like extreme concern for my wife and my daughters back in Nashville, I got online and I booked the last flight home from Philadelphia, which was the nearest airport. And then I booked an Uber. And the Uber picked me up outside the arena. I remember racing to grab, pack my things and run to the Uber. And I get in the back of this car and we begin the close to an hour drive to Philadelphia. It was an expensive Uber ride. But these are the things you do when you gotta get home to your family, right? And um, I'll never forget, I'm, my mind is racing. Concerts have been canceled. Uh, how's this gonna affect the financial picture? How am I gonna take care of my family? How am I gonna take care of my employees, my team? All these things circling, not to mention, okay, I've gotta wear a mask, this feels weird, what am I doing? Meanwhile, my Uber driver is happy as can be. He's playing the radio and he's driving along. I, he was from a, a third world country and when he spoke, he spoke in broken English. And midway through the drive to Philadelphia, my ear caught the song that was on the radio. And wouldn't you know it, it was my song. <laughs> it was a song called The God Who Stays. And the lyrics say, you're the God who stays, you're the God who stays, you're the one who runs in my direction when the whole world walks away. You're the God who stands with wide open arms and you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God who stays. So I'm listening and all of a sudden I hear my Uber driver start to sing along with the radio. You're the God who stays. He's singing in broken English, so I start singing too. Wondering if maybe he would notice the similarity, and I kind of went for it too. You're the God who stays. I start singing, and then I asked him, I was like, how do you think I sound? And he said, oh, oh you know, okay. I was like, probably not as good as the guy on the, on the radio, right? He goes, oh no, not so good. And, but then he tried to comfort me. He said, but you know, it's not your fault. The guy on the radio, he probably practices all the time. So if you practice more, you might get better. <laughs> and I'll never forget, I just smiled. And for a second, I totally forgot about the world in turmoil outside of the Uber car. And I engaged in a conversation with my Uber driver who shared with me how thankful he is to be in this country. He shared with me where he comes from. And I asked him what that song meant to him and he told me what it means. He told me that it's, it reminds him that there's a God who will never leave him. And I couldn't help but just be humbled in the biggest way in that moment to think that here I was in the backseat of this Uber driver's car and God was choosing to use my own song to speak to me. And it's funny, that happens a lot. Matter of fact, before I go on stage, there's a simple prayer I pray every night. I don't, I don't know why I pray this prayer, but a long time ago this hit me and I said, Lord, give me arrows. And I, I always would pray that my songs would go out into the crowd like arrows, not painful ones, you know, like uh, Cupid ones maybe, that they would shoot straight to the heart of an individual who needed to hear each message. It's actually my prayer for this right now, that these messages might be arrows straight to your heart. But God answers our prayers differently than we think he should sometimes. And sometimes I feel like God whispers to me, Matthew, you asked for arrows, but I'm giving you boomerangs. And those arrows turn into boomerangs. They come right back around and they hit me in the heart. That was a boomerang moment in the back seat of that Uber driver's car. Because what wound up happening in the months after that is a, an age dominated by distance, right? We've been separated from the things we love to do, the places we love to go, the people we love to see. We can't see people's smiles. Uh, we have to be six feet apart. All of these things that, that began to take place, we had to learn what, what is social distancing. We had, we had to learn all of these things, and it, it was scary. And yet there in the midst of it, I could feel like God was whispering to me, Matthew, I'm the God who stays. While you may need to experience social distancing, Aren't you thankful that you never have to experience spiritual distancing? A friend once said to me, if you ever feel a distance between you and God, God is never the reason. We are the ones who, like the old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We wander, but God stays. And I, I think about this scripture in Hebrews 13, five. It's very simple, but it is so powerful. Never will I leave you. 
never will I forsake you. I looked up this other translation and I love this. Uh, Hebrews 13, five, God says, I'll never let you down, never walk off and leave you. So what did I learn about legacy from the Uber driver? Man, boy, perspective is everything, you know? Perspective is everything. I've learned that um, I have a God who stays with me no matter what. And he calls me to live my life in such a way that I'm going to stay with others no matter what. And that through my life, may they see the relentless pursuit of Jesus. You know, I think sometimes my life can stop short of just receiving the love that God gives me, but then I forget that he's called me to share that love with other people. And an Uber driver uh, encouraged me, just like Ron from Houston, Texas encouraged me, just like Jordan's story encouraged me. I hope all these three stories encourage you most of all just to be reminded that there's a God who loves you and whatever you face, he is always with you. We just read that promise. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And when you take those promises to heart and you live your life, you'll find a peace, a joy, a contentment, a hope in any and every circumstance because you know who's with you. And when he's with you, you can have all of those things. Not only can you have the peace, the joy, the hope, the contentment, uh, but you can radiate that to other people. And that is the legacy. That's the thing that you can hand down. A life lived knowing who the author of your story is, knowing that because he's the author of your story that you are not defined by your failures, and knowing because he's always with you, never leaves you, and never forsakes you, that you can have peace, joy, hope, and love radiate from your life and impact the world around you. He's the God who stays. If I were you, I would have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause. Cause I feel just like a lost cause. If I were you, I would have turned around and walked away. I would have labeled me beyond repair. Cause I feel like I'm beyond repair. Oh, but somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. You're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands. With wide open arms, and you tell me nothing I have ever done. Cause separating my heart from the God who stayed I used to hide Every time I thought I let you down I always thought I had to earn my way But I'm learning you don't work that way Cause somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow you're still here You're the God who stayed you're the God who stays And you're the one who runs in my direction When the whole world walks away You're the God who stands With wide open arms And you tell me nothing I have ever done Cause separating my heart From the God who stays See my shame can't separate my guilt can't separate my past it can't separate i'm yours forever my sin can't separate my scars they can't separate my failures cannot separate i'm yours forever no enemy can separate no power of hell can take away your love for me will never change I'm yours forever cause you're the God who stays you're the God who stays 
You're the one who runs in my direction When the whole world walks away You're the God who stands With wide open arms And you tell me nothing I have ever done Cause separating my heart From the God who stays You're the God who stays Well, I'm not sure how I did as a keynote speaker, but uh, you know, it was my honor to be part of this special event for Inheritance of Hope. I wish you all the best and as you think about the legacy you and your family want to leave behind. I hope these stories have been an encouragement to you. And I just want to leave you with this final encouragement, just to know that your story can be an encouragement to other people. Thank you to Kristen, everybody at Inheritance of Hope for allowing me to be part of this special event. I wish you continued um, just strength and impact in the world because you're doing great work. So God bless you all. Thanks for letting me be part of this event. Wow, thank you, Matthew, so much for sharing these great stories of legacy. I think what really stands out to me is that you have shared these small, um, sometimes seemingly insignificant moments, um, but they were really, truly impactful moments. And I just love how your stories are encouraging others to um, think about legacy and to build legacy. And really that's exactly what this weekend is all about for our annual legacy event is to um, really just that, just think about your legacy and how you can tell your story. And we have so many great breakout sessions planned for you tomorrow. And we've also sent everyone a legacy event box and we've got lots of fun things in that box and so I want to invite you to open those up if you haven't done so already and just put in the chat um, what you have found very um, exciting and what you're excited about. I know that I of course always love the coffee and the Tervis mugs but I really love our new Vision 2021 t-shirt. So we are inviting you to wear this tomorrow on Saturday so that we can have um, fun pictures captured of all of our families in that shirt. And this is one thing I really love this year is that we have a long sleeve t-shirt. That was a big request. So I'm just excited about those things, but I want to um, hear from you. So please be typing in the chat and let us know what you really are loving. And so now I would love to pass it off to my friends and colleagues, Heidi and Spencer, and they're going to share um, some about the vision of IOH and some big things coming up with Giving Tuesday. So. Yay, thank you, Dina. And thank you so much. Um, I know maybe some of our families don't know how much work, I'm sure you can imagine what goes into creating such a spectacular event. Um, there are a lot of behind the scenes things in you and your leadership and how you kind of ran the show does not go unnoticed. So thank you, friend. I know thank that was you, a Dina. big Big job. Oh, thank you. And and actually, I want to give a big shout out to Heather Dodd and her team for, yes. I mean, could you imagine no. we <laughs> out around 650 boxes? Guys. Um, at some point, I think this weekend, I will post a little time lapse video so everyone can Holy see moly. the craziness that's all involved in that. So Heather, thank you so much. We just yeah. appreciate all the hard work all summer long. Yes, definitely. Yeah, well, um, all of those things take many, many people and, you know, reflecting back on this last year has been such a gift to us. Um, as a staff, we spent some time kind of looking back over what our last year entailed and it is incredible. Um, I really would love to highlight the fact that we quadrupled the amount of families we were able to serve in 2021, which is unbelievable. Um, Spencer and I have been having this conversation a lot lately, and we're just talking about how it is such a gift to be able to serve families, but then to be able to say, like, not only did we serve more families than ever before, but we quadrupled that is huge. So that is just definitely worth celebrating. Um, 
you know, no one wants to be in this position. No one wants to be a part necessarily of this group. And yet the need is there and we want to be able to walk alongside these families. And so families, um, we see you, we're glad you're here. And we want to make 2022 um, even better than 2021 was. So as you can imagine, um, that takes funding and it's maybe not everyone's favorite topic, but it certainly is our favorite topic. We <laughs> love inviting people into what Inheritance of Hope is doing. And so with this year ahead of us, we have a goal of serving 100 families at on-site legacy retreats. We want to serve 150 families at Hope at Home weekends. We want to serve hundreds of people every month through our Hope at Home groups, which are currently happening right now. Um, we want to have thousands of people next year join us for our annual legacy event. And all of that requires so much um, time, energy, commitment, all of that. And we are here for it. We're excited about it. Um, with that, though, comes the need for funding. So I want to have Spencer just kind of walk us through a little bit because we have a very big day coming up. My favorite day of the entire year, Giving Tuesday. Right. So we have Giving Tuesday coming up on November 30th. Whoop, whoop. And that is really the biggest day of the year for us as an organization. Um, it can't be downplayed at all how big of a deal totally. it is for us. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of plans this year because like Heidi said, when you want to serve more families than ever, obviously we need bigger goals than ever for Giving Tuesday. And that's what we have this year. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you, the only way we're going to be able to hit these goals is with probably every single person here tonight helping us to it. <laughs> so there's a lot of different ways that you can help us do that. Um, first and foremost is with fundraising pages which um, I'll just let Heidi quickly share about that. And then I'll share some of the yeah. other things. So Heidi, sure. talk about that. Better. So um, if you go to inheritanceofhope.org forward slash GT 2021, someone is throwing it in the chat right now. You can either donate or make a page. Um, if you are on our serving teams, we've already done that for you. We are happy to make a page for you. That is a very simple way of just sharing on your social media how other people who you know can be serving, um, I'm sorry, donating towards Inheritance of Hope and all that we have going on this year. So that's super easy. You can either make a page, you can have us make a page, um, or you can share that main donation page, whatever you want to do. But we are here for you to make it as easy as possible to share with um, your friends and family what Inheritance of Hope is doing. And hopefully everybody will do that. And so that once you're done doing that, the other biggest thing that we need your help with is obviously sharing and inviting other people, sharing on your social media and inviting other people to participate in Giving Tuesday with us. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I everybody knows that I was a family serve, but it's inspiring to me when other families pay it forward because mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's exactly what I feel like. I feel like I can't pay it back what I got, but I see other mm -hmm. families do it. Everybody here is getting a chance to participate in this weekend and be served. And so, you know, sharing and inviting others to participate is how we can continue to pay it forward and make it so that those huge numbers, all those families out there who have never been touched by Inheritance Pope are going to be touched in, in this next year. Yeah. So that's the, those are the two biggest things that you can do. Um, make a page, share and invite, make a page, share right. and invite. Yep. Just keep yep. saying it. We'll say it all weekend. Probably. Totally. It's, it's like um, a little cheer and you can just cheerlead your way into what's next, which is at 10 p.m. Eastern. Make a page, share and invite over to your um, adults. We will see you at cocktail hour. I will be there. Grab your cup of tea or maybe some of the coffee in your um, box or your favorite beverage and join us for cocktail hour. And... And Spencer, you're going to make a page and share an invite. Right. Over. over to the team group, which is starting at the same time, 10 p.m. 10 PM Eastern. Excuse me. I'm stuck on the cheering. Um, so <laughs> we have tons of games planned, a really fun night. We have our meeting, you know, I think uh, hopefully a couple of times, but this is the place to be. If you are in the team group, I will be there. Very excited to okay. see everybody. 
so exciting. All right, well, that is all we have for you tonight, families. We are so excited to be spending the weekend with you. Take Dina's words to heart, please. Um, you know, attend what you can this weekend. All of these recordings will be made available. We are just so thrilled to be with you. If you have any questions about Giving Tuesday or fundraising, or you know someone um, who you want to connect us with, you can email me, Spencer. It's just our first name at inheritanceofhope.org. Um, we would love to connect with you. And we will see you a little bit later. Bye, everyone. Bye, all. <laughs>